Good morning. We're beginning our Bible study here on June 7th, Holy Trinity Sunday. And I realize that what I write is going to appear backwards on the whiteboard here, which I did not anticipate. So please try to uh, imagine it if you're watching on the recording uh, the right way. So uh, have your Bible and your hymnal ready this morning. We are going to look at our creeds and especially the Athanasian Creed, which is confessed in our churches just once a year on Trinity Sunday. So I have a Bible and a hymnal ready. In the back of your pew version of the hymnal, we have on the right side, the Apostles' Creed, and it is the shortest of the three. It's also the earliest. It was developed over a number of years over many centuries starting in the early church on the right on the sorry on the left side of the hymnal you have the nicene creed and this one you're used to confessing every sunday morning in the divine service it is uh, longer each of the three articles one for each of the three persons of the holy trinity and then today we confess the athanasian creed and uh, that's on page 319 in the hymnal so that's what we'll look at more of today I do want to compare and discuss the creeds again a little more probably next week and maybe even the one after, but I want to hear your questions, comments, and conversation about creeds and how and whether they are important for us today. And I also want to make sure that if anyone joins us on Zoom that I let them in right away so they aren't waiting. So I'm going to keep checking that every once in a while to make sure. Before we begin our study then of our creeds and confessions, the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Please show me now your ways that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word, and I will declare your greatness. Amen. We get a number of publications here at Redeemer Lutheran Church, and I encourage you to read all of them, or at least one or two of them, as your time permits you. But one is called the Lutheran Journal, and we get a huge stack of them. It comes out just once a year. Here's the recent issue, the Lutheran Journal. And I look through it, and there's not usually a lot of very deep theological content in it. There's kind of some nice stories and things like that. So I was very pleasantly surprised when this most recent version of the Lutheran Journal had, at the very end, you got to get all the way to the last page to find a, an article called uh, the Athanasian Creed. And it's just two pages. It's a very nice introduction to it. I want to include it hopefully in next week's newsletter. I know it'll be the week after Trinity Sunday, and we will have long forgotten about the Athanasian Creed, but I want to keep the conversation going and talk about why it's important. There's a picture on the front, and it's a knight holding a shield. So I'm going to move it up here so it can be seen on our recording. And this is a very ancient illustration. It is, uh, it's in Latin, of course, so we can't can't read it directly, most of us right there, but I'll draw an English version of it here on the board. It's from the 1200s, and it's a depiction of who God is, the Holy Trinity. In the center is the word God. At the three points on the sides, it has the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and it tries to illustrate the Holy Trinity and how to understand and confess and believe in the one true God by saying that the Father isn't the Son, and the Son isn't the Spirit, and the Spirit isn't the Father, so we're not mixing up the three persons. But then they all point to the center, which is to say the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And, and it, goes, it actually goes both ways, too, so that God is the Father, God is the Son, and God is the Holy Spirit. So we can say he's one God, even though he is also three persons at the same time. To back up, and before we get really into the specifics and particulars of what is the Athanasian Creed and why do we confess it and what do some of those words and statements mean, let's back up to creeds. What's a creed? I believe. That's exactly it. So the Latin word is credo, 
and it means I believe. Now, I had a friend at the university and he used to wear a t-shirt and the t-shirt had a quote on it and it said, everyone should believe something. I believe I'll go fishing. <laughs> and then it, it said that it was attributed to Henry David Thoreau or something like that. So who knows if he actually said that or believed that or confessed that. It is a creed, right? He believed that he, he should go fishing and, and we all believe something. So uh, the, the first thing about creeds is that everyone has a creed. Everyone believes something. Even if you say, I believe that, that there's nothing. Oh, of course, it, you'd have to look around and try and modify that statement and the fact that there is something. And then you might want to ask yourself, why is there something or where did it come from? And now you're starting to get into a confession or a creed of faith. What do you believe about what exists and why it exists and for whom and how it exists? So it, it's, it sounds kind of philosophical, but it is ultimately spiritual and it's religious. And this is why there is a church. This is why we get together. There is a God and he's revealed himself to us and we confess him and we teach him and we recite and actually say it out loud in the creeds. So creed means I believe. I include it in this week's mailing to everybody. So you got this either in the email or in the paper mailing that where you probably might hear the word creed most often is in a big long creed or statement that is called a non-discrimination clause. So when a university admits students or when a business hires somebody or something like that, when that happens, there's this clause and it says that uh, this organization will not discriminate based on color, race, gender, national or ethnic origin, disability or veterans or other status, or religious creed. Have you seen things like that or heard them? Most places will have something like that these days. And I don't hear creed being used very often otherwise. So it's not used really in a positive sense of it's good to have a creed or good to confess a creed or here's our creed, but rather we we simply aren't going to uh, look at this when we either hire or don't hire you or something like that. And that, that's understandable, right? For certain positions and jobs that that can be a good thing that it's not based on certain characteristics that don't really have to do with that job, right? They're hiring you on the basis of other factors like your experience in the field or your work ethic or your references or something like that, right? So. Uh, it's not to make a, a judgment one way or the other, but that's where you hear the word creed perhaps today. Now, I said that everyone has a creed and I stand by that. You can please challenge me or tell me otherwise, but uh, I'm convinced that everyone has a creed. They're, they can't all be right is probably the next thing that you would say, right? The, the person who says there is a God and the person who says there is no such thing as a God Right? One of them can be right, but they certainly can't both be right because they're completely contradictory. And that's even right there, we could have a whole study just on that kind of relativism or moral ambiguity today that a lot of folks think, well, your, uh, your religious creed is your personal private preference. And by no means should anyone think that it's an ultimate universal truth. Right? That's kind of where we're at today. Now, of course, it, it can only be that. I say the creed can only be this, this ultimate universal truth and that it should be talked about and that it does matter. Now, this makes us very rare and very much in the minority and very strange and exotic, I think, to most people, that anyone in his right mind, you know, and maybe that's up for debate, sorry, but <laughs> uh, would still say today that there is an ultimate universal truth that we can know and then we can believe, teach, and confess, and not swerve from it, and stick to it until our dying day. That's, that's what a good and true creed would be. Let me tell you, now even within Christianity, even within the true religion, there are folks that don't use creeds, and they don't appreciate creeds, and think that they're actually kind of harmful and detrimental. So I want to address that really quickly too. If you, if you go to most Sunday services these days and, and most Christian denominations, you won't confess a creed. You won't stand up and recite the Apostles' 
Nicene or Athanasian Creed. And there's any number of reasons for that, but here's a couple that I've heard. Some folks say no creed, but the Bible. What do you think of that? Next question. Start plugging holes in that where you find things that they hold to that are inconsistent. Yes. So you're saying, what about the Bible? Right? What do you yeah. what do you say about the Bible? Right? And and what about the fact that it, you can start with a specific example, right? Rather than perhaps something general. Like First Peter three verse twenty one clearly says that baptism now saves you. No creed but the Bible. What does that mean? Does it mean that baptism saves you, or does it mean that baptism symbolizes your salvation? See, so uh, even before we get to that, let's say that uh, this this is a creed, right? <laughs> So saying no creed, but the Bible is itself a creed. That's the first problem with it. And then the next thing would be, well, we actually need creeds. I want to say uh, not only is our positive statement of I believe this, and I will believe this no matter what, because God has told it to me through the Holy Scriptures, and here I stand and I, and I dare not change it, but also as uh, there's a, an additional reason, and that, that would be sort of the negative reason that there are a number of lies that have come into the world. There are all number of falsehoods about who God is and who we are. And so creeds are a, a helpful and healthy response to that. So the creed, and you know, because there are many false gods, we say in the Nicene Creed, I believe in one God. So right there already, that's a positive, wonderful, healthy statement to make. And you should say it out loud in church with other people who believe the same way. But you're also saying, I don't believe in many gods, right? So there's a positive and a negative to it. You're both responding to the falsehood and you're speaking out loud the truth. Pontius Pilate, the governor in the first century, one time he said, what is truth, right? And the guy right in front of him, the Lord and Savior of the universe, Jesus Christ, true God and true man, had already answered that just the night before, actually, because he said, I am the way and the truth. truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So he, he had already answered that. And to anyone who will still hear his teaching today, he is still the way and the truth and the life. Not a way or a truth or a life, an option among many, but the only, right? It, it's exclusive. Now, love is uh, people say it's inclusive, and it is in the sense that we should love everybody. But the highest and greatest love in a very interesting and important way is exclusive, isn't it? One of the most important vows that not everyone takes, but many take, is the vow of marriage. Till death us do part, right? I pledge you my faithfulness. It's incredible the, the vows that people are willing to take and thank the Lord for that. It's a good thing. But uh, it, it is, uh, it's exclusive, isn't it? In fact, it says forsaking all others. And I think, well, you don't want to forsake other people, right? That's not very nice. But you're forsaking them, not in the sense that you don't love anyone else, but in the sense that you are pledged only to this one person with the marital union and intimacy and the marriage bed and your faithfulness until death. That's a, that's a two-person commitment and, and no one else, right? It excludes the whole universe except for those two people. That kind of love is exclusive, and that's a good thing. Thank the Lord for that. That's where we get families and stability and teaching and meals and uh, fun and you know work and house and home and the economy is based on the family and uh, you know God has a family, the church. Uh, these are good things and they should be protected. And, and in that sense, it's good that it's exclusive, right? The creeds are exclusive. They're not trying to. It, our goal in confessing them isn't to have us and them, and we're better than the people who don't confess them. The creed is a good, loving thing to tell the truth and to invite other people in to confess it with us. And in fact, it's a great point of connection. Well, what do you think? What do you believe? Well, let me tell you about my creed. I didn't write it, actually. And you didn't write it. And Redeemer Lutheran Church didn't write it. The Missouri Senate didn't write it. We weren't around for hundreds and hundreds of years before. Right? It was written. It was written a long time ago by people across 
the world and time and space who believe what God has revealed, a timeless, eternal truth. Please. Um, and I'm trying to remember, one of the two creeds, either the Apostles or the Nicene, um, there is actually, at the end of it, a whole list of anathemas or things that they reject. Um, we don't usually say it every Sunday, but there's a, they, in addition to the positive affirmation, they also explicitly state and reject. Um, I'm just trying to, drawing a blank, which of the two shorter creeds that anathema or the reject statements were attached to originally. That's an excellent point. And I was uh, actually reading about that this week in this excellent book. If you want more of the history behind these things, uh, this is called the Lutheran Confessions, and it's called History and Theology of the Book of Concord. Now, I said last Sunday that the first three documents in our Book of Concord were not written by Luther or Melanchthon or the writers of the formula decades later. The first three documents are the creeds, the ancient ecumenical universal Christian creeds, apostles, Nicene, and Athanasian. In that order, both of their length and of historically, that, that apostles came first uh, out of many different short forms, and then Nicene, we'll talk, I think maybe next week get into more of that, and then Athanasian last. So you mentioned anathemas and saying, not only is this the truth, but then here, therefore, are the errors, right? This is the truth, here are the falsehoods. Apostles in Nicene don't have that in the form that we confess them in our daily devotion and in our Sunday worship, at our baptisms, confirmations, and funerals. But they, they did at one point. And let me point out a very common time that we do have anathemas, or uh, we don't believe this, or no one should believe this. It's at a baptism and at a confirmation, actually. Did you notice that instead of just confessing the creed all in a row, there's a question and answer format? And the first one's negative. Do you renounce the devil? See, this is a creed. It's not, it's not a statement, but it's a question and answer sort of creed. And the answer is, yes, I renounce him. And the next question is, do you renounce all his ways? Yes, I renounce them. And do you renounce all his works? Yes. So that's anathema. That's, you know, we're against that. Here's what we're for. Do you believe positively in God the Father, yes, and then you respond, and God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son? You respond, yes, with the second article, and in the Holy Spirit, yes, with the third article. So there's, there's positive and negative, there's truth and error, and sometimes it's even in the form of question and answer. So I, I've, I've mentioned different forms. Uh, there's the, the declarative creed and the interrogative creed, speaking and questions and answers. There's also another way that we confess the creed, and I really enjoy it, and I hope you do too. We did it like over and over again this morning, and we'll do it next Sunday during Matins. It's just singing the creed. Yeah, uh, you did a great prelude, Jeremiah, on <laughs> we all believe in one true God, right? So Luther said it to, to this music, and there's three stanzas, guess why? For the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, right? And so in his own way, based on the creed, he, he just, we, they just sung the creed. And in fact, that was one of the five ordinaries in the liturgy that was usually sung every week. And one of the first things sung by the congregation, and not just by the pastor or the choir, but by everybody, in their own language, right? So vir glauben all in einem Gott, right? So we all believe in one true God. And we're going to do it next Sunday in one of the oldest forms of any creed whatsoever in Matins. It's called the... Te Deum. Yeah. Te Deum Laudamus. Te Deum Laudamus, right? We praise you, O God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. Did you notice that the Te Deum occurs on three pages of the book? You, you sing the first page, and you flip it, and then, and then the second and third pages. Why do you think there are three pages or groups of stanzas? Well, there's one for each person of the Trinity, right? So look for that next Sunday, and I'll, I'll try and remember to mention it too. The Te Deum is a creed. It's a sung creed, and it's ancient. So, uh, as far as we know, it was written by the guy who taught Augustine, whose name is Ambrose, in the 300s. That's how old it is. Very ancient. 
and very good for us still to sing today. So we can sing it, we can ask and answer it, we can just stand up and confess it, but the, the most important thing, of course, is that we believe it, right? Other people can hear what we say and they can see what we do. God alone can see our faith, right? Everyone else hears our confession and sees our good works that flow from that faith. So in this, uh, uh, let me uh, say one more thing uh, against creeds. Uh, I, I want to come out, you know, publicly in support of good creeds and publicly uh, against bad creeds today. <laughs> so uh, no creed but the Bible. Uh, that's a creed, but it's not a good creed. I'm going to cross it out. Because again, the, uh, we do confess the Bible and the scriptures, and our creeds are just drawn word for word out of them. Right? So we confess the Bible, but it's okay to summarize it too. And it's okay to paraphrase it and sing it as well, right? We're not confined just only to the literal words, but we also want them to flow into our lives, conversation, singing, praise, and prayer, as well as confession. Here's another one, and this is perhaps far more popular today among Christians, and then also I'd say outside of the Christian church. Here we go, deeds. Not creeds. Ever heard that one? This is very popular, perhaps becoming more and more popular. Deeds, not creeds. Now, the first problem is the same with the one right above it, which is that that's a creed. See? Saying deeds, not creeds is a creed. It's a confession of faith. It, it, is, it is the wrong faith. It's incorrect. It's not, it's not what God himself reveals. Now, um, it, yeah, it, it's a, also a false dichotomy, right? Because Christians, our creeds mention deeds all the time. Our creed is the reason for our deeds, isn't it? We would, we would have no reason or motivation to do good works to help the poor and oppressed and needy and the unborn and the families and the church and the state and, and ourselves if we didn't have creeds. So I, I want to reverse that thing entirely on its head and say that it's because we have faith in the triune God, not because we're splitting hairs or getting really theologically specific, but because there is a God and because he loves us and he made us and everything that exists and Jesus died for us and the spirit calls us to faith and Christ is risen indeed and will come again and will be with him forever. There's a creed and that's why we love other people. Because God has first loved us. So to reverse this and say, ah, well, we need less talk and more action. Well, how about both? Right? <laughs> let's talk. Uh, let's listen to God and to each other. And then we'll speak in response to what we've heard. And then we will act. Let's do all of that and not just some of it. Because uh, action apart from creed is pretty empty and meaningless. If you go out there and try to save the world and engage in every cause of social justice but have not faith, what, uh, to kind of change the wording of, of 1 Corinthians 13, you're a, a big lot. It, that's what's hot air and, and no action, right? That's what's a lot of talk and no truth. We, we love our neighbors because God and Christ first loved us. So creeds are not just okay to have. They're vital and they're very important. And they should be at the center of our worship like they are in the service book. They should be at the center of our daily life and devotion too. Uh, so this is a creed. It's a false creed. It's got it flipped and reversed. And let's let's flip it back and say creeds and then deeds. Deeds flow from creeds. See, if you've got a bad creed, you're going to end up doing bad deeds. The Christian creeds then, uh, so at that diagram I was telling you about in that shield, you have God in the center, right? And you have is on the sides, right? And you have the Father. You have the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit. And then you would also say it's not, so that you don't confuse the persons. Again, it's not just splitting hairs or trying to be overly dogmatic or difficult or disagreeable, right? God has revealed this to us. We know that it's true and trustworthy. And we want to stick to it no matter what, because there is salvation in no one else. Um, the, the irony of saying 
no creed but the Bible is that the Bible is what? Filled with creeds. Over and over again, personal corporate confessions of faith uh, from individuals and families speaking the truth to the King David writing the Psalms and confessions of faith that are to be sung and prayed and confessed to uh, to formulations and letters of Paul that are you know have the germ of early creeds. We'll look at some examples here. But the, the Bible is filled with creeds and, and everyone has a creed. And so we want to have a true creed and then we want to invite the whole world to confess that true creed with us. Any question, thought, comments so far? I want to uh, give you some time to interject. Um, if you are watching or listening on Zoom, please, uh, you can type something into the chat box or ask on the video. Uh, if you're live and in person with us, please chime in. And if you're watching this recording later, just please uh, email, text, or even put a comment below the video, and then we can continue this conversation about creeds. Let's get uh, specific about the Athanasian Creed, and then I want to run through some very important Bible verses, too, at the end. We'll kind of save the best for last, All right? We're working up. We're starting general, and we're getting more specific, and we'll end with the divine word of God itself, which is the most important thing of all. You have your hymn book. You're on page 319, please, with the Athanasian Creed. The Apostles and Nicene creeds are more similar to each other. And I think that I'll probably save more of that for next week. Of course, we could do months of study on each of the articles because it's just the core and center of our faith. It's just, it's just the deeds of God in history. It's how and in what way God loves us and proves his exclusive love for his people that uh, you know Jesus did, did not value his life above ours, but laid his life down for us. The, uh, first of all, really brief history of the Athanasian Creed. There was a guy named Athanasius. That's who the Athanasian Creed is named after. Now the Apostles' Creed is named after the Apostles, right? Whether they actually wrote it, some traditions say that there are 12 lines and each Apostle contributed a line. Maybe that happened. Uh, it's kind of nice to try to trace the development over hundreds of years, starting in the first century, going all the way to the 600s with that. The Nicene Creed, we know for certain, uh, there's an ancient city called Nicaea. Yeah, that's where the Nicene Creed comes from, and the first council of the churches in Nicaea in the year 325, that's when that was developed. Now, technically, when we confess what uh, was added to, and, and really our form is more based on the, the next, or the second church council in Constantinople, and that was in 381. So some folks hyphenated the Niceno constantinople Creed, okay? So that, that's what we confess, because it was added to later, and it has fuller information in the three articles. Athanasian Creed was named after Athanasius. This guy was bishop of a city called Alexandria in the country of Egypt, a very important African early center of Christianity. Athanasius was 27 years old in the year 325. We won't fault him for being a young guy. <laughs> it was the first council of Nicaea. It was convened by the Emperor Constantine. You'll hear stuff about that, and I, I could go into a long tangent about it, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't exactly like the emperor was forcing the church to say, believe, or confess something, but there were these squabbles, right? You had the folks following the teaching of Athanasius and, and the bishop, Alexander, and you had people following this other guy named Arius, and they were very much opposed. One said that Jesus Christ is true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, as our catechism says, as Luther explained the second article. And Arius said that Jesus was created by God and that he is the first among all creatures and that the, per the man, Jesus Christ, is not the eternal divine word, which is not some small little accident or error. <laughs> that is huge. That is right at the heart and center of the faith. So it was not a small disagreement. Now, in that book, I was also interested to learn that the more things change, the 
the more they stay the same. There were mobs of people taken to the streets in those days over this controversy. So if, you, if you're upset, and, and rightly so, right, about the, the injustice and the rioting and the, the murders and everything going on, right, on all sides in society right now, it's nothing new. And I know that's not comforting, but the fact is that, that the, the sinful nature and, uh, and, and these sorts of injustices have gone on for all of human history. And that there's a good and godly response to them. Uh, back then it was to, let's call a meeting, right? Let's talk. <laughs> and let's not just have people, you know, dragging out the, the one bishop and putting in their favorite, but let's talk about the differences and come to an acknowledgement of the truth. There were at, uh, so at this Council of Nicaea, where they developed the Nicene Creed, there were like there were um, 318 bishops there. So a pretty good sized church meeting. And they went back and forth and they discussed these things and they ended up, I would love to have seen just how they did it. How did they draft the creed? How did they decide what would be in there and what wouldn't? What's that? These post-it notes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. That's, that is definitely how it happened. So, uh, so this council, so Athanasius is this defender of the faith. He confessed the, the two natures of Christ. He confessed the Holy Trinity. As far as we know, and as we can tell, he did not actually write the Athanasian Creed. It's named after him and his teaching, not that, that he necessarily wrote it. Uh, in fact, in your re I like that there's these two paragraphs in your hymn book. It gives a nice introduction to all this. In the, in the old books, they had this creed, which is great, because hardly anyone ever confesses it anymore. And if they do say something about it, it's critical or negative. Uh, this gives a little background. Fourth century, like I said, African pastor named Arius, teaching that Christ is not true God. The church responded uh, with the Nicene Creed. Then another creed was written. It was attributed to Athanasius, it came, but it came later. And then it talks about the faith. So really quickly, the outline. I also like that there's verses. We didn't used to have that. We all had to say the whole thing, and it felt like it took forever. And, it, and I think if you weren't used to talking about God, the Holy Trinity, it could be frustrating. And I don't want that. I, I want us to learn and see and read and hear who God is and uh, you know, how the creeds speak of that drawing right out of the scriptures. Basically, ver there's two halves. Verses one through 26 are about the Trinity. Verses one to six are about God, the Holy Trinity. And they, as you said about creeds with anathemas, they both confess what's true and false and what you should believe for salvation and must not believe to be saved about the Trinity. Then, and, and it got a little more familiar for you right towards the end, didn't it? Like, okay, now we're in familiar territory. We're confessing the, the historical truths about Jesus, not who God is in his essence, like up there beyond our knowing or comprehension, but how he came down from heaven to earth and was one of us and we saw it and the eyewitnesses wrote it down and he will come again in the same way, right? That That's perhaps easier and more concrete. We can, should confess both who he is and what he does, right? Both the creed and the deed, right? First the creed and then the, and then the deeds of God. So I, I, again, I'm okay with the deeds and, and creeds. So let's talk about God's deeds first, right? Rather than jumping immediately to how, how can we always be doing and doing and, and improving ourselves, that's a good thing. Let's save that for after who is God and what does he do for us? That's the goal of divine service and of our whole Christian life. So those are the two sections, really, uh, the, the Trinity, and then and they're the two greatest mysteries, by the way, of all time. Not a mystery like, like a murder mystery, like who done it, like we need to solve the mystery, not that kind of mystery. The two greatest mysteries of all time are, first of all, how can there be one God who's also three persons? And the second great mystery equally important is how can there be one Christ and yet he's both God and man. And I don't think we can spend too much time talking about either of those things. They're very, very important. And it's the only name by which we can be saved. So that's important for here on earth and forever in heaven. So 
So any, anything you want to talk about directly about the Athanasian Creed, there are two problems with the Athanasian Creed that you probably heard when you were confessing it this morning, and I'll draw those out if you want to just dive right into those. Two problems. Okay, you ready for those? The first one is the word Catholic. Yeah, right. I knew, I knew it. Yeah, we're, we're all... We're all tracking. We're all on the same page. So, yeah. And so yeah, you did notice that it's a lowercase c. Okay. Catholic in the Athanasian Creed, uh, let's do this mathematically, does not equal the Roman Catholic denomination or, or sect of Christianity. That's not what it's referring to. Catholic is an adjective if you want to do parts of speech instead of a proper noun. Okay. So it's, it, it, notice it didn't say the Lutheran faith or the Methodist or the Baptist or the Roman Catholic or Episcopalian or Church of God, any of that. It said Catholic, lowercase c, right? Because it's a description. The word Catholic itself, apart from its, its supreme connotation today of, of the Roman denomination, the word Catholic means universal, or it means according to the whole, literally. It, it comes, it, it's drawn right out of the Greek word katahole, right, according to the whole. So you'd see holistic or something coming out of that. Catholic just means all Christians, everybody. Past, present, and future, every continent, race, tribe, and language confessing the faith together. So that's why it starts off by saying that if you desire to be saved, you must above all hold the Catholic faith. So, yes, we also believe, teach, and confess that the Lutheran confessions that we studied Augsburg Confession a couple years ago, we learn the catechisms all the time, uh, they, they are Catholic and universal. Again, not that they're Roman Catholic, or, and, and they're, they're Lutheran, but only in the sense that Luther also taught them. Luther didn't come up with it. A few years ago with the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, I read some really good, interesting articles and books about the Reformation. And I, I learned a lot and I appreciated a lot of these things. And one thing that kept driving me bonkers as I was reading these things is that various authors over and over would say that it was Luther's teaching. Or they would say that it was his new teaching. That made me even more upset. His new teaching. New teaching was the problem. Getting back to the original old scriptural teaching was the solution. It wasn't new. The Reformation wasn't new. It was, it was in fact, kind of uh, trying to go back to uh, what it was originally and what it was before. And to get rid of the new teaching, the new teachings were the problem. And the old eternal, so there's nothing wrong with something being ancient or old. In fact, if it's lasted this long, there could you know, why not give it a shot that they might actually be quite true and eternal and salvific. That's what the Christian faith is. So Catholic is universal. So whole, and, and it says right here, too, I found that very helpful. Um, in the introduction? Yeah, the, the second paragraph now in the introduction, page 319. The Athanasian Creed declares that its teachings concerning the Holy Trinity and our Lord's incarnation are, quote, the Catholic faith, end quote. In other words, this is what the true church of all times and all places has confessed. So that could in no way be limited to the Lutherans or the Roman Catholics or the Methodists, but this is universal. This is basic Christian truth. And this is the dividing line then between the, the Arian heresies, which are still alive today, right? Denying the divinity of Christ, whether it's in the Mormon church or the Jehovah's Witness church or the, the Muslim religion, right? All those religions all are united in the fact that they say Jesus is not true God. He's not of the same, you say in the Nicene Creed, substance with the Father and the Spirit. Right? So just anti-Trinitarian, basically. And that, that's, we won't give that up for anything. That, that's who God is, and that's who he tells us that he is, through the prophets and apostles, and especially through Christ our Lord. So, Catholic, and then can I point out the other difficulty that you had confessing this creed? Ready? 39, there it is. I knew, okay, and there's, there's other difficulties too, but maybe it's more with comprehension rather than 
this rubs the wrong way and goes against the grain and sounds like it contradicts the word of God. Look at the very end of the Athanasian Creed, page 320, the last two sentences here. Well, really it should be, the. let's just take the last three together, 38, 39, and 40. It says there, at his coming, that's Christ's coming, all people will rise again with their bodies and give an account concerning their own deeds. That's in the Bible. That's in Matthew 25, right? And that's where he will divide them as the sheep and the goats, right? And on the left will be those who did not feed, visit, clothe, give a drink, and help the least of these his brothers. And on the right will be the sheep who, who did and didn't even realize a lot of the time that they were visiting, helping, feeding, clothing, and giving a drink to the least of these Jesus brothers. So yeah, uh, we will give an account concerning our deeds. And, and you could also take one verse from uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians where he says that uh, each one of us will appear before the judgment seat of God and give an account concerning our deeds. So yes, faith alone saves, and your deeds that flow from faith will be recounted on judgment day. Okay. Now the next verse is where you think, you know, what did this, did this writer get it right who wrote this creed? And those who have done good will enter into eternal life. And those who have done evil into eternal fire. This is the Catholic faith. Whoever does not believe it faithfully and firmly cannot be saved. Now, please take your Bible in hand, and I want to show you directly where this comes from in the Bible. And it is the words of Jesus. And we will wrestle with them and believe them and confess them. It's John chapter 5. I read a critique by a formerly uh, Missouri Synod Lutheran pastor and professor of the Athanasian Creed. He said it's an error and he said that we shouldn't use it anymore. And I read on because I, I thought, well, that's not correct, but I, I want to see what he says and why. And, and one of the reasons he gave is that thing that we just read, right? Those who do good go to heaven, those who do evil go to hell. Well, it sounds like works righteousness, doesn't it? It sounds like it goes against all the writings of Romans and Galatians and against the teaching of Christ and that we're justified by God's grace uh, apart from works, right? Not by anything we've done. It's not by our decision. It's God's work and his choosing. Um, but, but try to consider what he means by this. In John 5, let's start at verse 24. John 5, verse 24. This is Jesus speaking. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. What about that? Now, look at the order Jesus treats this. First, in verse 24, he says, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. This is how we're justified freely by God's gift of faith alone, which comes by hearing the word of God alone. That's how we're saved. Then, in order, historic order and theological order, he moves to the third article and to the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting and the sheep and the goats in the last day, right? Having been justified by God's grace through faith alone, without accounting for the works that flow from faith, only on the faith, then those who come out, the ones who have done good, which is to say those who believed and did good works that flow from faith, will go into eternal life. So as long as we include the, the whole package deal and the, the entire teaching, then this is very true and good to know. 
that when we talk about the resurrection, we do talk about those who have done good. Jesus will say that you have done good on the last day. He's not justifying you and saving you on the basis of your works. He is judging and, uh, and sending you into eternal life on the last day, having died in the faith and, and discussing those good works in front of everybody. So for those who believe, what you do is good, right? It is not good works that make you good, but faith that makes your, your works good. See, first you have the, a good tree produces what? Good fruit, a bad tree produces bad fruit. A, a good tree can't make bad and a bad can't make good. So those who don't believe are in the eyes of God not doing good works. And they'll be surprised on the last day because they will say, well, when did we not? We did all these deeds. We didn't, we didn't get all caught up in creeds. We didn't argue about doctrine, right? We went out there and we tried to save the world and do all these good things. Uh, and he'll say, but what about, what about me, <laughs> right? What about the true God, the one who made all these things and, and offers you his baptism and faith in church and wants you to join and be active and confess his truth before him and other people and then do deeds as a result of that. And they won't, they won't have anything to say. And so that's why this word is going out and we're inviting the world to confess this truth with us because there simply aren't good deeds without faith in the eyes of God. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that in the world, it's not a good thing to, to feed and to help and clothe and visit and, and do all these good works and charity. That's objectively good in the world. But regarding God and eternal life, faith is, is how God saves you and the good works you'll mention it at the judgment. Does that, does that make sense? We can still say the Athanasian Creed, yes? <laughs> We're not gonna tear page 319 out of the book, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> Please talk to me if you're planning on doing that. <laughs> Question, comment on, on those thorny issues that, that rightly understood, these are, these are very good scriptural things to confess, right? The Catholic faith is, is all of the teaching of the Bible. And, and for the whole universal church, whatever denomination it's found in, right? The, the Lutheran teaching is the true teaching. There are also believers in other churches that believe the true teaching. They're just membership is, is somewhere else. And that's important and, and will be reunited on the last day in full communion fellowship. And then, uh, and, and yeah, the relation of our creeds to what we do in, in the world. So that's what Jesus says about those who have done good. You can only do good if you believe, and if you don't believe, there are, there are no good works then that, that can save you before God. Uh, as far as the Athanasian Creed, just another general comment about it, because we won't be able to get through you know, just the whole thing, which I'd like to do, but um, to sum up the first section about the Trinity, again on page 319, just to outline it might be helpful. It talks about the Catholic faith in the first three verses here. And then you've got the God and Trinity and Trinity and unity. So that Trinity is, is three, right? And unity is one. We confess both, that there's one God and that there are three persons. And then we're saying all these things to the effect of there, it's not like each person is one third of God, or it's not like God appears as the Father at one moment and then appears as the Son at another moment. It's called modalism. And it's not that they're all mixed together in, in one uh, you know, mixture. So that's another problem. And uh, so condemning all these different errors from the ancient church and actual teachers who taught them, the creed gets very specific. Now, why, is it, why do we have to keep having longer and longer creeds to get more and more specific? It's because people keep getting more creative with their errors, <laughs> right? It's because there, there are so many false teachers that have gone out in the world. In the beginning, we could just say that Jesus is Lord and be done with it. That's a three-word creed. Jesus is Lord. It's in the Bible. It's true. It's perfect. Um, as the errors come up, you, get, you respond to them and confess the truth against the error. The Augsburg Confession, uh, all the confessions in that Peter's edition, it's like 600 pages. Uh, it's not too much for anyone to read if you just take a bit at a time. But again, it's because over the ages, the creative uh, you know, devils and, and wicked human teachers just keep piling on the errors, and we're going to respond to them so that, so that people don't lose their faith over them. 
Uh, so yeah, it was nice when we had shorter creeds and we still confess those, but we need the longer ones too to, to maintain the truth. You have the fathers, the son, and the spirit. You, you have the glory equal and the majesty co-eternal, right? So the equality of the father, son, and spirit. Um, in, in verse eight, nine, and 10, 